Today's video is Joktan, the son of Eber. But before we get too deep into the video, first I want to tell you guys about my social media platforms. So I have a Clubhouse account, and we can actually talk to one another on it. I also host Clubhouse Rooms every now and then, where I might talk about history and genetics of the Middle East and Africa. I have a Twitter page, a Facebook account, and a Facebook page, as well as a Instagram, all titled The Hebrew of Israel. And what I typically do on these platforms is post upcoming videos as well as um, slides for my presentations. And so just be on the lookout for all of that on my social media platforms. And if you want to support me financially for the channel, you can look at my Patreon as well as my PayPal and my GoFundMe. And with all of that out of the way, let's begin with the video. Had two sons, Joktan and Peleg. Peleg name means division, divider, or split. Perhaps because when Eber was born, the Tower of Babel event occurred. Genesis chapter 10, verse 21 through 25. The, and children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. Our fact said begot Shelah. And Shelab begot Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Peleg uh, means to split or divide. Peleg was the brother of Joktan, who were the sons of Eber, mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. Peleg and Joktan are the two dividing arch fathers of Shemites. Peleg, being an ancestor of Abraham, and the Joktanites are the last mentioned Shemitic generation before the Tower of Babel was built. We're going to focus on Joktan. Joktan is very important figure for our research. According to Genesis chapter 10, verse 24 through 31, Joktan descendants settled from Mesha to Sephar. Genesis chapter 10, verse 24 through 31. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Almadad, Shelef, Hazarmeth, Jarah, Hadorum, Uzel, Dikla, Obel, uh, Ab 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 Abimel, Sheba, Ophir, Havila, and Obed. All these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling place was from Misha, as you go towards Sephar, the mountain of the east. The Misha, King Misha of Moab was a king of Moab in the 9th century BC, known most famously for having the Misha stele inscribed and erected at Dibon. The Misha stele is known as the Moabite stone. It is a stele dated around 840 BCE, containing a significant Canaanite inscription in the name of King Misha of Moab a kingdom located in modern Jordan. So here is the area where the Misha Stila would have been. As they said, it's in modern Jordan of Debaban or Deban. And the Joktanites dwelt from this location in the Jordan near Misha, but also they dwelt in Safar. So where is Safar? Safar, biblical Safar, ancient Arabian site located southwest of Yemrim in southern Yemen. And so, Sevar is an ancient Hemorite site situated in Yemen. And so, as you can see on the map, that is where Sefar is. So, if you were to put these two places together, from Misha to Sefar, basically from the Jordan and the Levant to, to Yemen in southern Arabia. This would have been the territory of Joktan. 
Jokdanites settled from Misha to Safar, Misha being the Levant, and Safar in southern Yemen, in southern Arabia. This is interesting because Jokdanites traveled, uh, likely traveled from the Levant going south, which could lead, um, you know, more evidence to the idea that Shem and Eber settled in the Levant because you have Jokdanites there. As the scriptures say, and their dwelling place was from Misha as you go towards Sephar, the mountain of the east. So from Misha to Sephar. A straight line, likely the migration route would have been from the Levant to Yemen or from the Levant to the southern Arabia. With that being said, this does fit the migration of Semitic languages. Semitic languages spread from the Levant into southern Arabia. Here is the Bajan uh, model, the latest uh, model when it comes to the origins of Semitic languages. And as we can see on the map, Semitic languages began in the Levant and, sp and spread south into Arabia and even into the Horn of Africa. With that being said, who are the descendants of Joktan. Joktan, according to A.T.S. Bible Dictionary, son of Eber, and by him connected with the Hebrews and other Shemitic families, he is believed to be the Koktan or Yoktan, to whom Arabian writers trace their purest and most ancient genealogies. According to Easton's Bible Dictionary, there is an Arab tra tradition that Joktan, Cockton, was the progenitor of all the purest tribes of Central and Southern Arabia. Joktan, Quoktan, Cockton, Joktanites, uh, Joktan's descendants are called Joktanites. There are there is an Arab tradition that Joktan was the ancestor slash progenitor of all the purest Arabian tribes of Central and Southern Arabia. And as you can see down here with the uh, ancestry, Noah, Shem, Arfaxat, Canaan, Shelah, Eber, Joktan. The term Quoctanite referred to Arabs who originate in Southern Arabia. According to Arab tradition, the Quoctanites are Southern Arabians unlike Adonites, who are from the upper area of the Arabian Peninsula, descended from Ishmael through Adan. The Quaktani people are divided into the two subgroups of Hamir and Kalan. And forgive me for my pronunciation. Arab tradition, Arab tradition uh, maintains that a semi-legendary ancestral figure named Quaktan and his 24 sons are the progenitors of Yemen who controlled the Arabian Peninsula known as Quaktani. All Yemeni tribes trace their ancestry back to this Saba, either through Himir or Kalan, his two sons. Yaktan. He has also been identified as Quaktan, the ancestral figure of Quaktanites in traditional Arab, Arab genealogy. The term Quaktanite or Quaktani referred to Arabs who originate in southern Arabia. In Quaktan, Banu Quaktan, Quaktanite, children of Quaktan slash Joktan. So, this is from Britannia, people of Arabia, ethnic groups. According to tradition, Arabs are descended from a southern Arabian ancestor, Quaktan, forebear of the pure and genuine Arabs and a northern Arabian ancestor, Adan, forebear of the Arabized Arabs. So there's two different Arab types. You have the pure Arabs, who are Joktanites, Quaktan, the sons of Joktan, then you have people who are Arabized. So the descendants of Joktan are Arabians. This makes sense because according to the scriptures, the descendants of Joktan settled from Misha to Safar, which is basically Arabia, specifically Western Arabia near the Red Sea coast. And their dwelling place was from Misha as you go towards Sephar, the mountain of the east. Joktanites, being descendants of Eber, would have been the first people to settle Arabia. 
because Eber and Joktan predate even the birth of Abraham, uh, and, and they predate the birth of Ishmael. So Joktanites are the first to settle Arabia. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, furthermore, Joktanites are considered to be the purest and most ancient of Arabians. This makes sense because according to scriptures, Joktan would have lived six generations before the birth of Ishmael. This, would, this makes Joktanites the first slash oldest Arabian people, which fits the tradition of the Arabs. So here is a map of the genealogy. Here is Ishmael, Abraham, Terra, Nahor, Serg, Ru, Peleg, and then here are the Joktanites. Joktan being the brother of Peleg and the Joktanites, who will be the second generation living along the same time period as Ru. And this is about six to five generations before even Ishmael existed. So Joktanites would indeed be the purest and most ancient Arabian type long before Ishmael. A lot of people uh, don't know this, and that's very important to our understanding of the Arab type. So the fact that Joktanites lived around the Red Sea of Western Arabia is fascinating. Furthermore, the fact that they are considered to be pure ancient Arabians is equally intriguing. But why? Because the people who are generally closest to Bedouins and Arabians are the Natufians. Excuse me, people who are genetically closest to Arabians and Bedouins are the Natufians. This is from the Genomic History of the Middle East. Arabians and Bedouins are positioned close to ancient Levantines. Interesting, because Joktanites would have came from the Levant, Misha, and so far. When we substitute, substituted Levant Neolithic with Levantines as source of ancestry in the Middle East, we found that Arabians could be successful, successfully modeled. Interesting. Arabians are very close to Neolithic Levantines and Natufians. Arabians require additional ancestry from a Natufian-related population. Arabia has higher African and Natufian-like ancestries. In addition to our models, suggests that Arabians could have derived their ancestry from Natufian-like local hunter-gatherer populations instead of Levantine farmers. And so here, as you can see, is the Natufian genome in blue, in light blue. And here are Saudi Arabian peoples who have quite a bit of Natufian. Also Bedouins, I should have had this highlighted, but Bedouins have a very good amount. And so do people of Yemen and Qatar. These groups have high amounts of Natufian ancestry. Now here's another paper dealing with the Natufian ancestry and Levantine ancestry. It's called Projecting Ancient Ancestry in Modern Day Arabians and Iranians, a key role of the past exposed Arabo-Persian Gulf on human migrations. And so it reads, modern Saudi Arabian and Yemeni samples clustered tightly in a low in a in in the low lower left quadrant overlapping with the three Natufian samples and were close to the Levant's PPNB and PPNC, pre-pottery Neolithic B, pre-pottery Neolithic C, and Levant Bronze Age samples. So modern Arabians and Yemen, Yemeni people are, are clustered tightly with three Natufian samples from the PPNB, PPNC, and the Bronze Age. Very interesting. Furthermore, two-thirds of the West Arab Persian population have ancestry shared with the Natufian, typical of the Levant. And so now I'm going to show you charts from this study. So as we can see in yellow, highlight in yellow, Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Here it is in yellow down here with the Natufians in red. They have the highest amounts of Natufian ancestry in uh, Arabia. And when it comes to the Levant, PP and B, again, it is Yemen and Saudi Arabia who have the highest. And now I'm going to show you a 
visual visualization of this. So again, we have an F highlighted. Natufians are highest, so the people in F, and I'll show you that in a minute. And again, Yemen and Saudi Arabia have the highest amount of Natufian. Yemen, Saudi Arabia, highest amount of Natufian. And just to show you what quadrant F is in when it comes to the study, F is this very dark green. And so here is where it will be at the highest amount, the Natufian. Basically, on the uh, western part of Arabia, near the Red Sea, where you see this high amount of Tufian ancestry. So it's like they migrated and situated themselves along this region. And so let's go on. The settlement of Joktan, the spread of Semitic languages, the ancestry of Natufians among Arabians, all overlap with each other perfectly. Just reading again. And their dwelling place was from Misha, as you go towards Safar, the mountains of the east. This is dealing with the descendants of Joktan. Misha is in modern-day Jordan. Safar is in modern-day Yemen. This is from the Levant to southern Arabia. This fits exactly with the migration of Semitic languages from the Levant into southern Arabia, down the Red Sea. This fits with the DNA of Natufians, Natufian ancestry among Arabians and Bedouins. When it comes to F group with the highest amount of Natufian ancestry, here is F. It's dealing with what? Arabia and Yemen. This makes sense considering that Natufians are genetically, are genetically very heavy with Arabian DNA. Again, this study says the Natufian sample consisted of 61.2 Arabian, 21.2 North African, 10.9% Western Asian, and 6.8% Omotic ancestry. But our focus is on the Arabian, and Natufians have 61.2% Arabian ancestry or DNA. And of course, I said that Eber and Azurad would be the descendants of the Natufians from, of course, a young earth perspective, but perhaps even an old earth, but focusing on a young earth, Eber and Azurad will be the descendants of Natufians. And this is a Shemitic and Hamitic union, Eber being from Shem, Azurad being from Ham, which Natufians, unironically, both have Asiatic Arabian and African admixture. As the Book of Jubilees, chapter 8, verse 9 through 10 says, Eber, and he took unto himself a wife, and her name was Azurat, the daughter of Nimrod. She bare him a son, and he called his name Peleg. Here's the genealogy. Shem, going down to Eber. Ham, going to Cush, going to Nimrod, going to Azurad, to Peleg and his brother Joktan. With that being said, Natufians had half of group E. Do Arabians also have haplogroup E? Such a scenario would also explain the presence of Y-chromosome haplogroup E in the Natufians and Levantine farmers, a common link between the Levant and Africa that was from pale, pa Paleolithic DNA from the Caucasus reveals core of West Eurasian ancestry. So from this study, the genomic history of the Middle East, it actually shows you various E markers found in the Middle East. As you can see right here in red and blue going all the way down just dealing with this section alone, it shows Yemen, 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 Saudi Arabia, um, uh, United Arab Emirates, Yemen, uh, Syria, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia. Just from this section alone shows a lot of basically Arabian and Yemeni Haplogroup E markers. Here's the E, by the way. And this is dealing with uh, time periods, by the way. This is dealing with timing going back, you know, <laughs> quite a long time. And, of course, there are other uh, people with haplogroup E within the uh, Middle East. You have Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Again, right here, you have Iraq. You have United Arab Emirates. You have Yemen. And you have Iraq again. You have, you know, Jews with it. 
a Bedouin, Israel, Negev, uh, Arab, Christian, and Israel. So Arab, Christian, and Israel, Bedouin, Israel, Negev, a lot of different samples of E markers uh, in within the Middle East. Again, this is from the genomic history of the Middle East. So yes, we do see Arabians and Yemeni people, Middle Easterners with haplogroup E. And this paper, or this website right here, actually goes into the migration of E into the Arabian Peninsula. It says, E-M34 lineages experience a much more dramatic expansion during the Chalcolithic Copper Age period, also downstream of CTS1096, the Y14891, and Z2108. Clades are typically found among people of Jewish ancestry, while PF6391 and Z21421 are found in the Levant, specifically Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, and the Arabian Peninsula. Now, what's in yellow is the most important thing to hear out. F1382 appears to have expanded during the Iron Age from the Levant to the Arabian Peninsula which is where it is exclusively, almost exclusively found today. So we do have branches of E markers starting off in the Levant and spreading into the Arabian Peninsula in the Iron Age. And so here's just a map showing the expansion of Semitic languages from the Bayesian paper. And here is a map showing the expansion of haplogroup E. As we can see, it perfectly matches how we see E migrating into Arabia and into the Horn of Africa, same thing with Semitic languages migrating into Arabia and into the Horn of Africa. And here, by the way, is a map showing the high, high amounts of haplogroup E within uh, the Arabian Peninsula and in Yemen. Of course, uh, the Natufians have 40 to 10 per, to 100 percent haplogroup E. And then when it comes to Yemenites and Dehimar, we find 50 percent Yemenites and Beda. Uh, 33%, same in uh, had, Hadea, excuse me for my mispronunciations, in Yemen and uh, in the Jordan of the Dead Sea, we see haplogroup E at 31%, and uh, these Yemenites have, these areas in Yemen have 25% uh, haplogroup E. So we do see, and here is, about, by the way, the, the places mentioned uh, where we see these high amounts of haplogroup E in Yemen. Here's the paper. But yes, it is definitely a fact that you see up to 50% of haplogroup E within uh, within Yemen in these locations. And of course, in the rest of the Arabian Peninsula, here's a highlight of the map dealing with Arabia. Specifically, E-M34, when it comes to this branch, you do see a lot of E throughout the Middle East. And so, you can also look at this paper, this website, should I say, it's called FamilyTreeDNA.com. It deals with, uh, well, actually you can just type in Natufian's DNA, Y-DNA classic chart. And basically what this does is uh, for genealogy within the most recent 15 generations, STR markers help define paternal lineages. Y-DNA STR markers change, mutate often enough that most men who share the same STR results also share a recent paternal lineage. This page displays Y chromosome DNA, Y DNA STR results for the project. It uses the classic form. The columns display each project member's kit number, paternal ancestry, information including to project settings, the paternal tree branch haplogroup, and, and actual STR marker results. So here is the Y DNA chromosome of Natufians or people who have this same Natufian ancestry. And as you can see, the Middle East most definitely has haplogroup E markers. And here are all the peoples who, you know, sent kits to uh, Family Tree DNA. As we can see, uh, by the way, you can go to the website again. This is Family Tree DNA, Natufians, Y DNA classic chart. If you want to see a closer image, sorry if it's too small, but. You can also type this in to look it up. But I took these screenshots, and as you can see, you find haplogroup E in Lebanon and Palestine and Kuwait and Iraq. 
Uh, here's Palestine again. Here's Yemen. Here's Lebanon. Uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen. Uh, you just find basically what I'm trying to express over and over again is that you do find haplogroup E within the Middle East. Here is the United Arab Emirates right here, a bunch of samples. Here is Saudi Arabia. Oh, here is a lot of Iraqi. Here is Iraq and Kuwait. Here is Saudi Arabia. Here's a lot of Yemen, Oman, and Lebanon. And again, you can go to this website. I took as many screenshots as I could, but there's plenty of just pages that you can look at and take screenshots and see. Again, here's a lot of Yemen. Find Yemen quite a bit in the um, in the Middle East. A lot of half group E in Yemen, should I say? Especially connected to Natufians. Again, Natufians would have migrated into the, into deeper into Arabia. Here's a lot of Yemen. Here's a lot of Iraq right here. There's a lot of Saudi Arabia. Here's a lot of Lebanon. Again, as they said, you know, half of group E was in Levant. So here's a lot of Lebanon. Here's a lot of Iraq. Here's a lot of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Here's a lot of Oman. It's quite a bit of Oman. Again, that's the southern part of, of southern Arabia, but a little bit more towards the east of southern Arabia. And, you know, here's a lot of Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, which is Iraq as well. But like I said, just go to Family Tree DNA, look up Natufian Y DNA Classic Tree, and you'll see all these people with half to group E in the Middle East today. And here's just a map showing uh, E-M123, another branch of E with that's heavily throughout the Middle East and in North Africa and the Horn of Africa. But specifically, E-M123 is very heavy, starting from the Levant going down the Red Sea, just like Joktun's descendants, and going all the way throughout the South Arabian uh, of the peninsula. So that's very interesting. So Arabians most definitely have haplogroup E, specifically linked to Natufians. Haplogroup E among Arabi Arabian populations is also uh, very uh, consistent with the understanding that one, Joktun descendants settled this region, two, where we find the closest uh, related populations to Natufians, and three, where the spread of Semitic languages went into Arabia from the Levant. Basically, the location being Western Arabia near the Red Sea. And again, this verse, Genesis chapter 10, verse 30. And their dwelling place was from Misha as you go toward Safar, the mountain of the east. Uh, this is Western Arabia, basically, the Red Sea. And this fits with the spread of Semitic languages. This fits with the spread of Haplogroup E. This fits with Natufian ancestry being in the, in the Western Arabia. This fits with E-M123 and other branches of E. Therefore, it's my position that, Arab that the Arabians with haplogroup E and Natufian ancestry are the descendants of Joktun. This makes sense, and this is, this is the most logical uh, thing I can think of when it comes to connecting all this together. Now, some people may say, if Joktun and his descendants had haplogroup E, and if Joktunites are the oldest inhabitants of Arabia, then shouldn't haplogroup E be more abundant within the peninsula? So that's a great question. When it comes to haplogroup E, it's actually actually the second largest haplogroup in Arabia. And I actually believe that this could be more evidence as to why haplogroup E Arabians are Joktonites. Although Joktun was the first to settle Arabia, his name may indicate that his descendants would not be numerous in Arabia. Joktun name means he will be small. And again, Joktun is the son of the famous Eber, his brother being Peleg, the forefather of Abraham, Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. The Joktunites are the last mentioned Shemite generation before the Tower of Babel was built. But the main thing I want you to get from this is that Joktun's name, it means he will be small. 
for a mean for a meaning of the name Joktan, N O B S E study Bible name list reads, He will be made small. Jones Dictionary of Old Testament proper names reads, He will be small, or He will be made small. With Joktan name meaning he will be small or he will be made small, etc., may refer to his descendants not being the most numerous in Arabia. And indeed, this seems to be true from an, anthropo from an anthropological perspective. If Joktan descendants truly are the indigenous Arabians that descend from Natufians, then we can actually see the meaning of his name in history. A, bottle, a bottleneck event occurred with indigenous Arabians that descend from Natufians. This study is called the Genomic History of the Middle East and actually deals with that. It says, uh, found Arabians have elevated basal Eurasian ancestry that diluted their Neanderthal ancestry. Now here's the important part. Arabians suffered a population bottleneck around the Eridification of Arabia, 6KY. So there was a bottleneck with Arabians. Although most of Arabia is a hyper-arid desert today, there were several humid periods resulting in a green Arabia in the past which facilitated human dispersals with the onset of the current desert climate thought to have started around 6KYA. The tolling from humid to arid periods in the late Pleistocene and Heliocene has been proposed to result in population movements adapting to the climate. We found that the ancestors of all Middle Easterners show a significant decrease in population size around, around the out of Africa event 50,000 through 7,000 YK. KYA. Following the Neolithic and with the start of the eridification of Arabia around 6 KYA, Arabian populations experienced a bottleneck. So Arabian populations experienced this. So uh, Arabia has higher African and Natufian-like ancestries. It has been suggested that population discontinuity occurred between the late Pleistocene and early Heliocene in Arabia. In addition, our models suggest that Arabians could have could have derived from derived their ancestry from Natufian like local hunter-gatherer populations. So this bottleneck event made Arab this bottleneck event uh, made Arabians with uh, Natufian ancestry less numerous in Arabia. Which is why half the group E isn't as numerous in Arabia today. It's because of this bottleneck. Um, and uh, in the past, it would have been more abundant had this bottleneck not occurred. Now, after all, when it comes to the origins of half the group E, there is an Arabian origin. Uh, this paper uh, called Carriers of Mitochondrial DNA, Micro Half the Group. L3 basal lineage, lineages migrated back to Africa from Asia around 70,000 years ago. So it says, curious, curiously, ancestral E lineages have been detected in the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant. Again, my position is that the Arabians with haplogroup E and Natufian ancestry are the descendants of Joktan. Haplogroup E, along with the Natufian ancestry, even fits with the spread of Semitic languages in Arabia. So it's, it's, it's a perfect match. I believe all these factors, even the small percentage of half the group E in Arabia today, for uh, fit the narrative of Joktan being small. I will cover all the descendants of Joktan in the future. I'll make a complete series, a complete video series dealing with the sons of Joktan. But with that being said, I'll only cover one of Joktun's sons, and that will be Sheba. So who is Sheba, and who is Sheba's descendants? That will be the next video. 
With that being said, this concludes today's video. Joktun, son of Eber. And as I stated, next video will be Sheba, son of Joktun. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the video and leave a comment for any questions you might have. And make sure you have a great rest of your day.